It turns out the fake Department of Homeland Security agents who infiltrated multiple different intelligence agencies, including the Secret Service, the White House, and Jill Biden's protection detail, they were apparently tipped off about the government's investigation. You can see it involves these two guys, Arian Tazarzadeh and Hader Ali. This one is Arian Tazarzadeh. We're going to call him Tazzy for this video. Apparently him sitting around a pool drinking beers with a bunch of Secret Service agents. Prosecutors are now acknowledging that this case is getting worse and worse. In fact, they say so here in a supplemental memorandum to support these guys remaining in custody, saying, look, this is a government prosecutor writing this, telling the judge, we cannot let these guys out of custody. If they go free, we're in big trouble. And if you remember on the last video we did on this, the judge was a little bit confused about how to keep them in custody because they don't have all big, you know, sort of extensive criminal histories that would justify continued detention. In fact, these are kind of just like minor gun crimes, maybe until you sort of get the bigger picture, but the government has to show that they can't just say, well, we think it's a big thing. They've got to have evidence before they keep people in custody. And here the prosecutor says, judge, listen at the Friday detention hearing, I know things were a little bit messy. I'm submitting this now to let you know we've got some supplemental information to tell you. And they write with every new fact that gets uncovered in this investigation, the story only gets worse. We've learned in the last 38 hours, everything that's coming out, there's no exceptions to this. With respect to what the court asked about, and remember the judge said, well, they had an organization, they had an LLC that was called Special Police. Was it legitimate at all? Prosecutor here says, no, not at all. The defense, there's no way, there's no question about whether they had anything legitimate here. They sought commissions to work as special armed spe special police officers, but they never got them. They were denied those licenses. And even if they had gotten them, anything that they were doing here, all of the things that we're gonna talk about far exceeded the scope of what they would have been allowed to do had they gotten those credentials. So they say, look, in addition, judge, within the last day, and this was filed, this is 11 page supplemental memorandum filed April 10th, 2022, Sunday, we know that the detention hearing picks right back up on Monday and that they're going to be arguing these things because the judge wanted supplemental information. The judge was very confused, says in the last couple of days, more troubling facts have been revealed. The ammo mags that came out of Ollie's Glock and Tazarday's Sig Sauer were illegal, high capacity magazines. And listen to this, after Tazzy was tipped off about the investigation, did you see that? After he was tipped off about the investigation, by who? Who in the intelligence community, was it Secret Service? Was it Department of Homeland Security? Was it the postal inspector who actually found this thing? FBI, who knew that they were under investigation and tipped them off? After they learned that they were being investigated, either he or Ali appears to have made further attempts to conceal the evidence. They started ditching materials, including they tried to corruptly enlist the help of a federal law enforcement agent. They have somebody who is basically turned willing to help them out. What is happening? Because of the breakneck pace of this investigation, there are many facts that we still do not know. But the facts that we do know about the defendants, Judge, they lied about their identities for years. They stored a cache of weapons and surveillance equipment in their apartments. They compromised law enforcement agents in sensitive positions. They tried to cover up their crimes. Leave no doubt. Judge, if you release them, they pose a public safety risk. Both defendants should be detained. Whoa, filed on a Sunday night before a second detention hearing coming on a Monday. It says in the District of Columbia, special police organizations are appointed by the mayor. And so you're going to see a big list of sort of uh, some law and authority. This prosecutor is telling the judge, judge, look at the law. Look, let, let, me, let me break this down. I know you need something to sort of hang your hat on. The prosecutor is giving the judge on a plate some justifications to why the judge can keep these guys in custody. And he's gonna say, thank you for this. This is very delicious. I'm gonna eat the whole thing. These guys aren't going anywhere in my prognostication. Here it says, judge, take a look at the DC code. Here you can see licenses. You gotta go and apply through the DCRA. They've gotta be approved by the Metro PD. They're restricted to a specific premise, like a location that they're authorized to guard and protect. They don't have a free range over Washington, DC. And he cites this. Look, for example, at the section 1100.7D, it'll show you right there. Also look at 1101.3 and others saying, according to Metro PD, 
in DC. Tazzy applied to be an armed SPO and was denied. And that got denied March 18, 2019. Why? Well, he's got a prior conviction for domestic violence. Oh, so he does have a conviction. It was for domestic violence. We don't know how long ago that was. And you know, whether that's a basis for continuing uh, detention, right? It may, might be 20 years old. The judge might say, well, you know, stuff like that, I don't think ordinarily is a big deal. And the judge has to sort of create some space in order to find a reason to keep him in, in custody. I'll expand on that just for a minute. If the point here being, if the judge latched onto that and said, oh, he's got a prior criminal conviction for domestic violence. Well, you know, the defense attorneys might say, well, so what judge? You've had 30 other defendants who came through here and each one of those defendants, uh, you let out on bond and they had other prior minor misdemeanor DV offenses from a long time ago. And so why is the uh, justice being applied in unequally in this case, right? Those types of arguments here, it says, Tazzy reapplied after he was denied in DC, was permitted to attain a commission as an unarmed SPO, that commission expired when he didn't provide any supporting documents. He didn't want that. What, I can't have a gun? Get out of here. Likewise, according to MPD, the Metro PD, Ali also applied for and was denied as well. That came in around October 2020 based on prior arrest for assault of family member. So he also apparently has some other criminal convictions, which we didn't know about this at the last setting. Assault of family member in 2018, malicious wounding and abduction by force in 2009. We did not know that. That's new information. Ooh. So they do have criminal convictions, both of them. In addition, according to, actually, you know, I don't, I wonder if those are U.S. charges. I don't know. In addition, according to MPD, neither defendant has a license to carry a pistol outside of his residence. So they're breaking gun code laws, but they're not being charged with gun crimes. They're being charged with impersonating members of U.S law enforcement. Nonetheless, according to witnesses, Tazzy regularly did and carry a holster for Ali's Glock and all of this recovered in penthouse five indicates this as well. And remember, these guys had uh, numerous penthouses in the crossings apartment, I believe it was in Washington, DC. And so they, they, they certainly were not following the, the DC gun laws, right? That's like an obvious thing. We saw all the camera footage, all the photographs, bins of weapons that have come out of this place so they weren't concerned about any of that but they haven't been charged with those crimes even though the defendant was commissioned by an armed spo in july 2018 tazzy registered the security company the united states special police llc and we looked at that website previously we also looked at their facebook page which they said was verified and it had the i think it, i think it was even uh you know check marked up as being a law enforcement organization according to mpd because that name risks confusing the LLC with federal law enforcement and conveying false authority, DCRA required the name to change. Sounds a little bit too close to like the U.S. Capitol Police, you know, United States Capitol Police, United States Special Police, United States Secret Service, United States whatever. A little too close to that. You got to change that. And so they didn't go through that, of course. He changed it. Oh, he did to USSP. And then their license expired and was not renewed. They never had any firearms registered. USSB supplies, neither the defendant with justification for their weaponry, none of their tactical gear. Basically, this is saying that, yes, judge, I know you asked about this LLC. We looked into it. Here's what's up. And they're giving details on this. Not renewed. They didn't follow any of the rules. They made a name change. Nothing was really licensed, right? This judge wants to make sure that he's not encroaching on these people's you know, constitutional rights or due process rights, making sure that he's not sort of overlooking a very real, clear justification that might enable them to do these things. Prosecutor continues. He says the government also learned that Ali obtained a license as a private detective. You can see where that comes from. This is what it allows them to do. Secure information for evidence relating to a crime or revealing the identity about a person or something like that. Kind of minor things. You know, not like a weaponized, deputized Department of Homeland Security secret undercover agent who has free range everywhere. It's not what a private detective provision license grants you. All right. And the prosecutor is making clear on the record to the judge that, you know, yeah, that, you know, you might be able to say he was a private investigator, but he wasn't. None of these things fall within that purview. Ali does not appear to have held himself out or conducted business as a private detective, and the applicable regulations confer no authority on detectives, private eyes, to carry weapons or convey law enforcement authority. He did. Remember, he had suitcases of badges. He had all the different uh, sort of, uh, you know, heavy gear. 
Indeed, unlike with an SPO license, because a private detective licensure does not confer special authority, it does not require special training. There appears only to be an effort by Ali to obtain the imprimatur of official authority for his deceitful scheme. Indeed, when confronted by a USPIS inspector on March 16, 2022, Ali falsely represented himself to be an investigator with USSP Special Investigations Unit, right? He was using that name. It sounded official. And so he was taking full advantage of that. He said it was part of DHS. It's part of the Department of Homeland Security. Postal inspector knew better. Nobody at the FBI or anywhere else did, but he did. Even if the defendants, says this prosecutor, were SPOs, okay, let's say, Judge, look, even if for the sake of argument, we said, yep, they got their licenses, names were good, they were doing everything above board, according to the regulations in Washington, D.C., even if they were doing all of that, their conduct, the things that they were actually doing were not authorized. So they were outside the scope of that lawful authority. Even if they were and ran a legitimate security company, their activities far exceeded the scope. In D.C., they say that the duties of special police officers is periodically checking doors, windows, like watchmen, that type of stuff. It says it, it restricts the display of badges, weapons. It says that it's got details about what they can do. Of course, they were not doing that. But these men did not confine themselves to checking doors and windows. I'm sure they did that, but that wasn't what they limited themselves to. They equipped themselves to break down the doors and windows and perform other armed law enforcement activities. You've got pictures of some of the gear they used. They amassed weapons, surveillance equipment, breach tools. As an initial matter, Tazzy, because of that domestic violence conviction, is prohibited from possessing even a firearm or a bullet because of that misdemeanor DV charge, which is why it's always important to make sure you deal with those charges appropriately on the front end and hire reputable defense attorneys. But even if Tazzy were permitted to possess a firearm at all, SPOs must request and receive specific authorization for the types of guns they were using. According to MPD records, neither Tazzy Alley nor USSP ever applied for their waiver. Defendants represented themselves as being engaged in covert federal operations, and they used that cover to get... <clears throat> Prosecutors acknowledging this now. They used that cover to gain the confidence of and compromise federal law enforcement agents in sensitive positions. They worked together to accomplish this. The defendants could not present a clear case of danger to the community. Footnote one. Footnote one tells us the government also received an alarming information from other witnesses, including a naval intelligence officer to whom Tazzy misrepresented himself as a Homeland Security agent. The intelligence officer was so alarmed and concerned about Tazzy's attempt to gather info that he reported the contact to the Naval Criminal Investigative Services. Did they do anything about it? I don't know. When did that happen? When was that report made? Because these guys were just sort of uh, palling around Washington, D.C. for years, hanging out with Secret Service agents in the pool. I think that was probably on July 4th. In addition, special police officers are strictly confined they're not allowed to use badges. In other words, there would be no legitimate purpose for Tassie to walk around displaying a badge or a weapon unless he was assigned to that property. Tassie was not authorized or assigned to use a weapon, and the government has not uncovered any evidence that he did work as an unarmed SPO. So, Judge, we have no basis to believe that he had any legitimate reason to do any of this stuff at all. I know you're concerned about it, but here's what we found. This is consistent with the purpose of these regulations. Why? To prevent special police from exercising their authority or for the public to perceive them as exercising their authority at any other place other than where they're assigned to protect. So it's kind of rudimentary, right? It's very basic. It's like, Judge, here's what we've found, but it's got to be that mechanical, that formulaic. Judge says, okay. This looks pretty good, pretty justified. Now we're going to see these two guys have hired lawyers and they're going to respond or they haven't hired lawyers. They've been appointed lawyers. We'll take a look at that in a minute, but let's finish with this prosecutor. He says the DC government is so concerned in general with these special police that even the markings on their clothings are regulated. Specifically, they can only wear patches or clothing that make it clear. They are special police, not MPD, not other law enforcement. They've got to have a distinctive shoulder patch, must be circular in shape, five eight inches, two lines saying special police. And it's got to follow the protocols, one half inch high on the center. Okay, regulations, all according to code. In other words, special police just can't wear whatever they want, whatever patches they want like this, 
They can't just say that we're MPD or we're a special agent or we're part of a crisis response team. We're a special weapons tactics team. We're a special investigations unit or anything similar. The item C serve the opposite purpose. Their markings were intended to mislead and deceive people into believing that they were something that they were not and that they had authority they did not possess. You can see all of these. Here's a don't tread on me sign. This USSP is their company, general police here. And we don't know what these other, you know, patches look like, but here this says, oh yeah, this says special operations unit, police special operations unit, right? That's not in comportment with special police. They've got to properly identify themselves and they have it. Here, they also seized dynamic entry kits from Penthouse 5, which is where they were residing, or one of them. They had a mini door ram. They had a sledgehammer, axe, halligan tool, and bolt cutters. Metro PD confirmed that not only are these items inconsistent with the responsibilities of watchman, but they are typically only issued to select MPD officers, right? Generally speaking, uh, they don't just you know, sell these things or hand these things out to civilians. These are law enforcement type uh, gear. And we saw previously that this was something that they used very effectively because other people from other law enforcement agencies would say, oh, you know, I got the new Glock. Uh, they're issuing the new Glock, whatever it was, over at the FBI. And they said, oh, you mean like this one? Like the one they gave me? Oh, yeah. And the guy goes, oh, phew. well, that's pretty amazing that you have that because I haven't gotten mine yet. I know how hard they are to get. I know they're only spe you know, special order for government issue, whatever. You have one. That must mean that you're somebody who's legitimate, right? And they were pulling it out all the time. We covered that in the original complaint. Here we see the defendants were also in possession of illegal firearm magazines, and they spent a lot of time on this, but as I've said sort of throughout, they're not being charged with gun crimes. They're being charged with impersonating law enforcement officers. Here they go through, they tell us, yeah, it's all illegal. DC code says it's illegal. Law enforcement seized five 12 round mags, uh, one 15 round mag, no lawful purpose for possessing these large capacity magazines, inconsistent with the special police officer or private detective. And so, you know, as somebody who um, doesn't appreciate the Washington DC gun laws, you know, a 12 round magazine, wow, that's shocking, you know, high capacity, okay. 15 round magazine, okay, got it. First Glock 19, right. So, you know, you can see though, the prosecutor is he's he's sort of applying Washington DC law. He's saying, look, there's no reason for that at all. And according to DC laws, we're lunatics about this stuff. So that's why it's going in there. Just to confirm, illegal judge also says finally the government notes the defendants work together and it made their scheme way more credible and it makes each one of them more dangerous. Each defendant did what he could to obtain some sort of armed law enforcement authority but was denied. Undeterred, they worked together nonetheless to take on all the trappings of armed law enforcement officers and falsely represent themselves and each other as armed law enforcement. According to witnesses, their scheme was effective in part because each of them vouched for the false identity and the authority of the other. Yeah, we're working together. Yeah, he's legit. No, I, know, I know him. I've known him for 20 years. He's as legit as they come. Here, in addition, the government has just interviewed a witness, a former U.S. States, United States Marine, to whom Tazi and Ali attempted to recruit and deputize for what they said were DHS operations. Now, I wonder if that was the same guy that they shot with a uh, airsoft gun in the prior video. That was part of their training protocol over there at DHS, I guess. According to the witness, in Tazi and Ali's presence, he observed illegal weapons, AR-15 M4 variant with an illegal suppressor had to be modified. AR pistol was modified, brace consistent yep, with the, okay. Paragraph four, after Tazzy, now this is where it gets very interesting. After Tazzy was tipped off, so somebody you know, in the government or who knew about this alerted him. Yep, they got you, buddy. You're under surveillance now. He and or Allie attempted to then conceal evidence. So they start to just get rid of everything. At some point, Tazzy was informed of the investigation last Tuesday. It appears that he and or Ali tried to conceal evidence of their crimes by shipping it out of their apartment complex. During the execution of the search warrant in Penthouse 5, law enforcement discovered shipping materials, UPS labels, which raised concern that the evidence being secreted from the premises. Right? They're not hauling things out in bins. They're just shipping them. Postman comes every day, just picks up stuff. They're just hauling it out. Oh no, we're under investigation, but we're not doing anything uh, uh, secretive or anything that is duplicitous. We're just shipping packages. 
These concerns proved true. On Thursday, April 7th, so two days of this go by, U.S. Secret Service Uniform Division officer referenced in the complaint and assigned to the White House, witness three, received a package sent by UPS Next Day Air. So while the investigation's unfolding on Tuesday, Ollie or Hader uh, or uh, Tazzy gets wind of this, starts shipping things out Tuesday or Wednesday, don't know, but on Thursday, he gets a package received. So it must've gone out basically that Wednesday. Corresponded with their apartment complex. Within this box were additional smaller boxes, which he hid six Sauer and Glock firearm cases. The kind of case in which a firearm is sold, but that does not correspond to any of the firearms seized during the search warrant. These cases correspond to purchases of a six Sauer, another six Sauer, and a Glock 19 generation four. Here are, are what some of the packages look like. So the secret service agent gets this, you know, these boxes in it. There are all of these firearms, I guess. In addition, the firearm case contained three ammunition magazines, one of which was a high capacity mag. Here's what those look like. Notably, at the time these items were shipped, the government was conducting constant surveillance of the defendants and their apartment building, which they almost never left. The government believes the defendants may have been aware of this surveillance and thus the shipping the evidence was their attempt to remove the evidence without the government's detection. So they're not hauling big bins of stuff in and out of the stairwells or the elevators because they know they're being watched. Just drop the packages off. Post office is just shipping them out wherever they're going. Don't know if they have any records of that. This went to a secret service agent. So they know where that one went. But what about all the other packages? Probably going through all of that right now. Here it says the package also contained a cigar case with four cigars. This is consistent with the prior pattern and practice of providing federal law enforcement agents with gifts and items of value. Suggests that Tazia and Ali shipped the package to the USS Uniform Division officer in an attempt to corruptly enlist him in secreting evidence. Cigars, you know, it starts small. Yeah, have a couple of cigars. Then before you know it, you're getting a $40,000 a year penthouse in Washington, D.C. See how that works? Yeah. Conclusion here from the prosecutor before we look at some of the attorneys who are now on the case. We have Tazzy and Ali, they write, were not legitimate law enforcement of any kind. They possessed illegal firearms, ammunition, fraudulent badges, other law, form, uh, law enforcement ID, surveillance force entry tools. When tipped off to this investigation, by whom? Who, who did that? He's saying tipped off, not discovered. Okay, they weren't, you know, walking their dogs and go, well, that's a weird FBI van over there. Why, why? Oh, there's another one. What's going on over here? This is weird. No, you're saying he got tipped off. Is there a mole in the government and the FBI? Is this a stinking movie? They attempted to hide evidence of their conduct. They started mailing out envelopes. Each hour since their arrest, the government learns more and scarier information right there about how Tazzy and Ali abused their fake authority. But this court has sufficient facts before it now to determine. Uh, we're not going to get into all that now. This is what you need to know. Do not release them. Their release would endanger the community and risk their flight from justice and the obstruction of critical evidence. Signed off on here by Joshua Rothstein, U.S. attorney out of New York. And uh, yeah. It's, it's a... It's a strong motion. It's a strong memorandum supplementing this, but it's still sort of lacking in, in a lot of teeth, right? These are kind of gun crimes they're talking about. It's, it feels really bad and they're not justified to, to do any of the or multiple allegations, multiple areas where they're breaking the law, but the judge is sort of looking for something more. Now, I think that the judge is still not going to let them out. And so the, this hearing is going to pick up tomorrow at 3.30 and they've got attorneys now. So they should be represented by the federal public defender for the District of Columbia. You can see Michelle M. Peterson got appointed here for Arian Tazer Day. And uh, she's gonna be the lead attorney over from the, 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 the public defender's office there in DC. Similarly, we have this guy. Now, something interesting sort of happening here. This is something that happens when you've got uh, co-defendants oftentimes who are getting public lawyers is they will split the agencies representing the co-defendants. So let me explain that. So here we've got Hader Ali. 
He's got a lawyer. This guy is Gregory Stewart Smith. And so I thought, well, that's interesting. This guy has a law office of Gregory Stewart Smith. He's not at the public defender's office like uh, this woman here is. And you start to say, well, oh, is that because Hader went and hired somebody, some, you know, really great lawyer who's going to get him off on all this stuff. And so you might think that. Because when you go look at Gregory S. Smith, you see this. It says client-centered legal representation. Now, apparently this is Greg Smith. And Greg Smith has on his bio, says he may be the only lawyer in America who's worked in the White House counsel's office, argued and won a case before the Supreme Court, which is super cool, served as the president of a major bar association, two separate cities, D.C. and probably another one, 20 years practicing law, zealously represented clients and all over the place. Okay, so it, it was... Whoa somebody who's sort of a kind of an impressive lawyer. What's going on here? He's got different ratings on Avo and all those things. Now he's in private practice. So you think maybe he got appointed, I'm sorry, he got paid for rather than being appointed, but I don't think that's the case. I think here he actually is somebody who has a contract with the, with the courts to represent people who are indigent, who can't afford representation. So you can see on his notice of appearance that he filed, he said that he is appearing appointed through the CGA, which is sort of a, a panel-ish type of, an organ, uh, of a format where you've got a, a bunch of different lawyers who are not working for the government as part of the federal public defender's sort of office as an employee, but they sort of work on a contract basis. And this is important when you have conflicts of interest. So now you don't want both defendants going over to the public defender's office because now they're, you know, one office is handling what could be a conflict of interest situation between these co-defendants. We have a situation, let's say that pops up where Hader Ali says, I had nothing to do with this. Uh, Tazzy's the ringleader on this thing. And Tazzy says, I had nothing to do with this. Ali's the ringleader on this. Now you've got a conflict of interest. If you have both of those defendants at the public defender's agency, uh, now, you know, you can make an argument that a, 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 one defendant can say, my case has been jeopardized because they're showing more attention to another co-defendant and I think I'm getting gypped. And so we've got due process problems. So what they do is they just split it up. They create another panel called the CGA, which is sort of a, a list of other attorneys who say, I'll take those appointed cases for a fee. And it sounds like that's what happened here. So we've got one person over at the public defender's office, another here, Ali being assigned to a CGA lawyer who's going to take the case up on contract. And uh, then we'll see what happens tomorrow. Now they're scheduled for a secondary detention hearing to talk about the supplement that the government filed. The defense attorneys are going to make their arguments. Of course, we're going to continue to follow it along. I don't, you know, I, I'm I, without a doubt sure that there's a lot more here that the government is not communicating at this time. I think they've communicated enough for this judge to sink his, his uh, teeth into and that they're going to hold these two people in custody based on the sort of totality of the circumstances, but you know, a lot of these crimes in and of themselves, at least, at least the ones that are articulated here, you know, patches and all of those things are, are enough, I think, to keep them in custody, but we're going to need to see, we're going to need to see more evidence before we can really understand, I think the, 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 the massive scope of what happened here, two years of these two guys communicating with secret service agents, department of Homeland security, agents, maybe special agents from the FBI. We don't know, right? These gun charges and these patches and all that stuff seems to be extremely, extremely minor relative to what we're talking about. And we're going to continue to follow it along. I hope you join us in that journey. If you follow this case, if you find this interesting, I'd, I really appreciate it. If you would share it with somebody else as we continue to cover this, we're going to follow this one very closely. And I hope you join us in that journey. Don't forget to subscribe before you get out of here, because I look forward to seeing you on the next one.